Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Anne Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. My guest today, Wesleyan University Professor of Government Sonali Chakravarti, considers questions of emotions, the law, and democratic institutions. In the context of the present divisiveness, these questions she studies are most salient. What is the purpose of the expression of anger in public life? How do we listen to rage? Author of the new University of Chicago volume, Radical Enfranchisement in the Jury Room and Public Life. Chakravarti offers what she calls a full-throated defense of juries as a democratic institution, writing that juries provide an important site for democratic action by citizens and that their use should be revived. She adds, the jury could be a forward-looking institution that nurtures the best democratic instincts of citizens, but this requires a change in civic education regarding the skills that should be cultivated in jurors before and through the process of a trial. Welcome, Professor. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I was struck by that introduction, um, a model of civic education and also accountability of your fellow peer, your neighbor. I am very interested in how ordinary people engage with political institutions. And um, juries are the place where ordinary people have the most power. They actually make the final decision about whether someone should be punished or not. Um, I called my book Radical Enfranchisement because um, when we think of enfranchisement, we usually think of voting and, um, and, and uh, kind of extending the, the vote to, to women, to, um, uh, to black people. Um, but we also uh, should think about how enfranchisement means being able to serve on a jury, which means that the state trusts you uh, to make this most important decision about uh, um, the fate of, uh, of a peer or a neighbor. Uh, and um, and if, when we think about it, um, the fact that the state trusts us to do that means that we have the um, cognitive capacities, the capacities of empathy, the capacities of uh, uh, understanding the law um, that we're not called upon to use very in many other um, in many other moments. Um, and so I think the jury service is the most demanding thing we do as citizens. Um, but I think it, it is also one of the most satisfying things that we do. Um, studies have shown that people who serve on juries leave with a deeper appreciation of the criminal justice system. They know its flaws, you know, and and right now a lot. People are talking about the need for major reform of the criminal justice process, and I agree with that. Um, but um, people who serve on juries come out saying, like, there are a lot that's there's a lot that's right about the trial format, and um, and they are ennobled by the by the power that they have as jurors. And often, I don't think it's highlighted enough, Sonali, that to say a society is free really, I think, demands that it has this process by judging people's guilt and innocence, a jury of your peers. Not only, like you say, traditional enfranchisement, but to be a free society, I think the jury system is something we take for granted, but we ought not to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and, and because um, uh, the jury are, is is the only place where um, you have people who are not repeat players in um, in the pr the process of punishment, right? Otherwise, you have lawyers, judges, prosecutors, police, lobbyists, officers, lobbyists, right? And um, and so, kind of to use your language of a free society, right? We need there needs to be some check on that system such that it's not putting forward goals that are uh, that are not democratic or trying to um, use the state for abusive purposes, right? We need some. Check 
check on um, other people who have power within the justice system, within, within the political system, and um, and the um, you know the founders brought over the idea of the jury from um, from England from the common law tradition because they saw that that is the one uh, one way to ensure that that doesn't happen. That it's it's the best check on corruption. It's the best best check on abuse of power. Um, I, I once presented uh, a paper on juries in China, and um, uh, many of the Chinese scholars that were there were saying like we're never going to have a full scale jury system. You know, uh, the the, the uh, Chinese Communist Party is never going to allow that. Um, but a few people were saying like we're we're dealing with corruption at a really high level, and you can't just put you know you can't just expect uh, the the party to police itself. We need ordinary people in there to decide whether this was corruption and whether it should be punished. And so it's the sense that like. Um, the system only works if we have, if you have some um, uh, some body of people that don't have other interests, um, keeping their jobs, keeping a salary, um, uh, moving forward in their careers, um, who are making these very important decisions about punishment. To what do you attribute the longevity, the endurance of this system, its resilience? Now we're going to talk about the problems, in which you highlight in the book. But to what do you attribute? the fact that this system has endured. I mean, it's it's in the Constitution. It's in the Sixth Amendment. You know, you, you, we can't get rid of it. You know, and I, and I always uh, like you know think that we would never be able to put in a jury system now if we didn't already have it. Like right. there'd be so many things, forces in place that would it would be like what you're giving to twelve uh, citizens, uh, you know, this kind of power. It would never it would never pass. But we it, um, I think it's endured because of its constitutional basis and because um, uh, you know everyone agrees that it is the kind of a, a heart of the justice system. That even though very few cases go to trial, and you were kind of alluding to that just now, um, uh, thinking about what the jury would do really structures so much of how we make laws, what lawyers tell their clients when they say, should you take a plea bargain or should you go to jury? Everyone is always saying, like, we have to think about what would happen if it went to jury. Would a jury believe this, right? Um, when we make a law, would a jury uh, want to find someone guilty um, uh, of this crime? Um, so the imagination of, of, of how the jury decides really structures so much of our legal and political life. But there hasn't been an overhaul of the jury system at most of those levels, municipal, state, federal. What we had early on is largely what we have now. I mean, go back to the Scopes monkey trial all the way to the present. Not much has changed, right? Yeah. Right. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. You are suggesting that we need to be more civically attentive to our peers you, you say we need to cultivate civic education in order to have a more effective modern jury system. What does that look like? You know, thanks for that for that question. I, um, you know, I think there was a time in the past where everyone um, remembered studying about juries in high school. And you know, I teach at Wesleyan University, and I ask my students, like, have you studied about the jury? And they say, maybe in my middle school, you know. But they really, you know, haven't had um, uh, you know a robust civic education in high school. Um, and I think actually, high school is a good place to start it. But um, uh, but I'm t you know, when in the book I talk about there are all these different skills that we need to develop. Um, before we serve as jurors, and then the, and use them and continue to develop them through the trial, um, skills of recognizing our own biases, understanding what it means to um, debate and deliberate with other people, um, understanding what it means to interpret statistical evidence. Right? All of these are, are skills that you gain um, uh, through through adulthood, and and I think learning about the jury, at, you know, after college, um, uh, wh when you're much more likely to be called as a juror, um, is is something that we really need, um, and I think we. We can get it in a couple of different ways. Um. I think that the uh, kind of after Trump's election, there's been a renewed interest in uh, the legal and political system through social movements, uh, through protests, um, and I think um, education about uh, jury service can be worked into those things. I think political parties should pick it up. I think candidates should talk about it. I think um, movements like Black Lives Matter should talk about um, uh, uh, why it's important to serve on a jury, even if you, the the movement is about changing the structure of criminal justice. Um, serving as a juror can be 
one part of the way, you know, one part of the way that you uh, um, influence who gets punished and who doesn't. Um, I think, um, you know, I think there should be, you know, I think comedians should you talk about this. You know, I, I know a lot of people get their news from John Oliver and uh, uh, The Daily Show. I think um, uh, 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 shows like that should talk about um, uh, the, uh, the jury system. Um, and, and so I think that there should just be this wider education about um, why we have a jury in the first place, um, how people are selected for juries, and what they should know about being, about being a juror. It strikes me that 12 Angry Men, mm -hmm. just look at the title of the film, right. that really probably is the most educational to the American people, 12 <laughs> right. men. Yeah, right. And, um, and so that really highlights what you identify as perhaps the most significant flaw still in the jury system today, uh, which is the fact that um, lawyers can um, basically decide who they want to prevent from, from serving on the jury, and as a result, they can get 12 angry white men, mm -hmm. not women, not um, men of color. Um, what is the status right now of what is allowable in terms of what lawyers can do to try to finagle their way to get a pool that satisfies what they perceive to be the biases that are going to favor their client, whether it's the government or right. a defense attorney. Right. Um, so now, if, you, if you're if you're called for um, for jury duty, um, uh, yeah, the f and and you're called to, uh, to uh, be part of the pool for a case, um, the first thing that'll happen is that the, the judge will ask you questions. Uh, will ask you maybe what what do you do? Who do you live with? Um, do you have any members of your family in law enforcement? Do you know anybody involved in this trial? And then the judge will decide whether um, you have any um, uh, pre existing biases that you wouldn't be able to uh, kind of work through during during the trial and if you don't then you're kind of cleared um, uh, uh, to continue in the process um, and after that process the lawyers for each side get a, a certain number of peremptory strikes um, which are, are just um, basically um, get out of jury cards uh, that they can use on any of the jurors um, they don't need to give a reason they just need you know the, the idea was that um, both sides should have a say in in what the pool looks like, and if both sides have an equal number of peremptory strikes, then that's a way of e um, making sure that the playing field is is um, equal is ba is balanced. But it doesn't quite turn out. It that doesn't way. quite turn out that way. And um, uh, the Supreme Court heard this uh, this case last term, um, Flowers v. Mississippi, uh, where um, a, a prosecutor in Mississippi um, effectively um, uh, removed almost all of the black jurors from a from a, a case where the defendant was black, where forty percent of the county. Um, uh, our black residents, um, so it didn't make sense that you would that uh, that this defendant would have a, a nearly all white um, uh, jury for a, you know a very serious case of you know four homicides, um, and one of you know, the, the the Supreme Court has recognized that this is a problem you know that when when uh, lawyers uh, practice discrimination on the basis of race against uh, against jurors, and so there is a remedy in which is um, it's it's called uh, a Batson hearing. Where um, where the, the the prosecutor who removed jurors is asked to say what were what were your reasons for removing uh, this juror and are expected to give a race neutral response. Um, uh, you know the, it's, the prosecutor could say um, you know I I felt that they weren't you know truly listening to the questions or I thought that they were you know um, biased because the baseball team they like is uh, you know is, is uh, it rivals with the other um, uh, with the you know my, my client. Uh, you know, preferred uh, team. It can be they can be strong responses, they can be weak, weak responses, but they just have to be race neutral um, uh, uh, reasons. And judges are inclined to believe them. Right? Judges are inclined to believe that lawyers are doing their job well, and um, and that when they give a reason, that's really the reason that they uh, that they intended. Um, but what what we we keep seeing is that oftentimes these reasons hide um, racially motivated reasons that actually um, uh, prompted uh, the lawyer to remove uh, remove the juror. And um, and that is what re results in um, uh, juries that don't reflect the communities that they're uh, that, that they're drawn from, and oftentimes uh, don't reflect the communities of the defendant. Um, and I think the the b uh, best response to this is to get rid of peremptory strikes. So only uh, you know allow uh, the judge to uh, to determine whether someone is uh, um, is able to uh, to serve as an unbiased uh, unbiased juror. And if a lawyer you know uh, says I you know, kind of put thinks that someone 
someone is biased, they should be able to make that claim, but you don't get any of these uh, kind of uh, strikes, peremptory strikes. And um, and this is a controversial um, uh, suggestion um, because, uh, you know, a, a lot of what I say in the book, um, uh, defense attorneys are, are, are open to and feel like I, I have this, uh, but that what I'm saying will help uh, defendants in a lot of ways. Um, but even defense attorneys don't like this idea of getting rid of peremptory strikes because they feel like they use it to, uh, to help their client. They, you know, they, they feel like well, they don't use it in a racially discriminatory fashion, but they want the opportunity to remove jurors from the pool. And um, and I see what they're saying, but I um, but my goal is to get juries that look like the communities uh, that they are uh, they are drawn from. And the best way to do that is to get rid of peremptory strikes. Or if they are not homogeneous, that they represent a diversity of opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, that mm -hmm. there there is some right. nobility and value in striving for um, an intellectually diverse group of men, women, yes. um, men and women. Yeah, right. No, I, I I agree with that, and and I think um, and and I think that's also comes with like with getting a truly random uh, selection of people from uh, um, uh, from the um, uh, area the jurors are drawn from. And I think there are kind of two other things we can do as well to get that. One is um, uh, change the way we we select jurors. Right now, it, um, uh, the pool for jury duty is drawn from DMV lists and voter registration uh, lists. And um, so if you know someone, or maybe you feel like you keep getting called for jury duty is because your your name is on both those lists and um, uh, uh, but what what's missing from those lists are people who don't have a, a driver's license who don't have a permanent address um, who might move around a lot um, and uh, so I think um, other states should follow what Massachusetts is doing which is have residency lists that are updated yearly um, uh, and says who actually lives in this uh, uh, in this jurisdiction and the jury pool should be drawn from that list um, and so we would get the intellectual diversity that you're that you're talking about, um, we would capture people who aren't captured right now, um, and then the other thing I think we should do is um, uh, compensate people um, uh, more fairly for their uh, for their service. Um, you know, uh, um, ancient Athens had uh, you know, used jurors, and um, and one of the, re it was the reasons why it worked in, in Athens was they they paid people a daily wage that was comparable to what a working man would get uh, for for the day. Um, right now, it, uh, if you're called for jury duty, um, uh, some states offer you know forty dollars uh, a day or sixty dollars a day to people who um, are losing out on salary by coming to uh, coming to uh, jury duty. Um, and some some employers would would not. And some uh, yes, yeah, so some employers don't uh, uh, you know uh, don't dock your pay right. If you're right. usually if you ha uh, if you're a salaried employee, you get your weekly pay right. or monthly pay, um, and, you, and, you, and some employers understand that. And I think could be even more encouraging about you know you should serve on a jury. We we will not penalize you in any way for that. Yeah. Um, but hourly workers, um, uh, uh, people who have their own businesses, right, other people who don't have that kind of salary structure. Um, uh, Really do lose uh, um, lose uh, um, the money that they need to live if they, if they are asked to um, serve on a jury. Uh, so I think the compensation for jury duty should be more um, comparable to what you know eight hours at, at a minimum wage job uh, would be. Have you determined that the problems are equally severe when it comes to discrimination and jury selection, um, in t in both? who gets called and who gets selected? Um. I, I think, yeah, I think they're consistent across the board that we have, with that who gets called and who gets selected are, um, are flawed um, uh, processes. Um, and, and that also that people who, who are really concerned about their economic well-being can't, uh, can't serve on, uh, can't serve on juries. And so I think those are uh, you know, um, some, um, that's, those are some recommendations for changing um, uh, uh, juries to make them more, um, you know, sort of more well um, I mean, I also think there needs to be a change on the motivation side. You know, I think um, uh, trying to get out of jury duty is uh, like a kind of longstanding American tradition as well. Um, uh, and um, and I and uh, you know, it always puzzles me because um, you feel like we, as a as a kind of viewing public, love television shows about crimes. We listen to podcasts <laughs> about uh, about trials all the time. Um, we are fascinated by the criminal justice process, but then when people are called for jury duty. Um, they think like I don't have the time to do it, or you know I, I don't want to actually have to decide. Um, and uh, what about fear of reprisal? 
You know, I think that, that that is there as well. You know, I'm thinking about the jury for the El Chapo case, you know, um, uh, sure. recently. So I, I, I it think doesn't have to be something <laughs> quite as, that quite controversial. As, right, yes. right. But I, I, th I think so. I mean, you don't hear about uh, um, uh, intimidation of jurors after cases too frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, More during the case More during itself. the case, yeah. The, um, uh, so, so I think that, I think there is that. Um, but more in, in what I found in, in accounts of people who've served on juries and and, um, and different uh, um, uh, research um, on this topic, um, more people. The, the idea is not to, not having the time to do it, and then also actually feeling like I don't want to have to be put on the spot to decide um, mm -hmm. that it's going to be impossible for me to say guilty because I'm going to feel bad, um, and, 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 and I don't want to be the one who says not guilty because then what happens if the uh, if the person commits another crime? And so, I, and I think this is actually uh, you know so, something that we need to grapple with. Like, why are we, we so afraid to judge in these contexts? What is the percent of the American public that ultimately will serve on a jury. I don't know that number, kind of like saying over the course of your lifetime, you know, is, I or, don't know. Right, or, or not even, you know, because I'm sure there are many people over the course of a lifetime who um, are excused every, mm -hmm. right, every time right, they're yeah, called. Right, right. Uh, um, so I just wonder w what percent we're talking about when we're talking about the number of citizens who actually do serve on a jury. Right. Um, but in the absence of that information, I, I find your subject and this question of radical enfranchisement to, to be parallel to other ways that the American people are not sufficiently involved in day-to-day -day governance and have really um, delegated an outsized influence to lobbyists and are not generally represented in the way that the Athenians mm -hmm. hoped. Part of that is scale, but part of that might be laziness, and that yep. is what you were so gently insinuating earlier. And maybe not laziness. Pick a word. Yeah, right, but, right. but I'm getting at this idea of participatory democracy because serving on a jury is, is the most intimate form of that. And some municipal governments are beginning to open their doors to lay people mm -hmm. to help determine when it comes to allocating expenses for your community, should this go to this police department, should this go to the Board of Education, and those decisions not being ones made only in city council or maybe not even in city council, but through person-to-person -person negotiation and groups uh, through participatory democracy. So how is the jury, as that model that you talk about, uh, something that can be emulated. When I teach about the jury, I teach it alongside teaching about participatory budgeting, using citizen panels to talk about health care reform. I think these are some of the things that right. you're alluding to. Um, I think the jury has a lot to offer to the, these other um, uh, forums for um, participation. Um, I think the most important is that um, the jury uh, uh, the jury system allows significant time for education on, on the issues, either through the judge and through the trial itself, for deliberation liberation um, uh, without um, outsiders present um, and, and and so it really has a pedagogical mission you know, uh, within the structure of the trial and I think um, when, when uh, citizens are involved with budgeting or health care they also need that time to to learn about the issues to think to talk um, and I think they need final decision-making power and this is often where it, it falls apart I think in um, in other in other forums that um, and that's uh, you know city governments let's say that give um, uh, citizens a, a, you know a voice in the budget but then might not actually let them uh, decide um, uh, um, ends up leaving a lot of citizens feeling frustrated that like I put in all of this time and I, I did the you know I did what I was asked to do but then the city didn't take my recommendation or our recommendation our, you know uh, that we achieved by consensus um, and I think what's so powerful about the jury system is how seriously people take their task um, when you're they're given the time they're given all the information they need, and they know that what they are, are going to come up with um, uh, will uh, uh, will have an impact on somebody's life, and and cannot just be overridden by you know by the judge or by another person who says they're an expert. Um, so I, I think that that um, you know it's that final decision-making power that really shows the trust that we have uh, that we have in people, and 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 um, people respond to it by taking it more seriously. And also the transparency of the process, insofar as. You may not be able to hear what's going on in the room in which folks are deliberating, but that you know here is the cast of characters, here are the people representing this decision, and 
also the technical parameters of, you know, here are the hours during which we're deliberating. They may bring some pizzas right, right, for right, us, right, right, right. but otherwise there are no interruptions. And, you know, of course you're given strict guidelines about making your deliberation the focal point and not letting any outside factors uh, distract from that. Right. Um, you know, one, one thing that, that I've thought a lot about is in the same breath of transparency and participatory democracy is, you know, just giving the American people from whatever state and city they come from a, a when they pay their taxes every year to to understand the allocation of the tax when you submit your tax and you know for one thing you could get a thank you from your state or your city or your federal government um, but beyond that actually having a digestible allocation of you know here's what you paid and here's what it went towards. Mm -hmm. And this is just precisely the example of the lack of accountability and transparency in the American system right now because a whole lot of us will pay taxes each year and not know precisely what they're they're paying for. That's an interesting point, and um, and you know, and, and it, I think you're you're picking up on this idea that like people will step up when they feel like they know what it's going to, or that they they they, they see some connection between what they're putting in and what um, what is happening um, at the governance level, even if it doesn't have to you know benefit them. I don't think people are as self interested as sometimes uh, we assume they are. Well, that's exactly when I said this to someone recently. It, they said, well, if we did that, people would just holler at, you know, yeah. they, they would see what their money is going towards and not like it. And, right. and But, you know, they're already dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, exactly. Surveys so of like, Congress yeah. show dismal rating, you right. know, in general, over many decades. So it's a, I think it goes back to cultivating an information um, sector and cultivating an informed electorate, which which we haven't really right. done. I, I guess I'm, I have... Um, just a, a little bit skeptical in some ways that we need the the kind of money breakdown. That if, is that the thing yeah. that we re, that that will give people a sense of uh, you know accountability. Um, I you know in a way we're living in this like age of data, right? That we you can you can get data on so many different things, but um, but what we still don't know or what people, the kind of the ed civic education we need is about how to prioritize different things, you know, at, at diff different levels of government and um, and what trade offs um, need to be made. Um, um, and uh, and how we communicate that to our representatives, how we communicate that directly, um, and so and so I feel like I'd rather have discussions around that, um, and then the, uh, the the financing part which, uh, should follow from it. If only because Sonali, it would reveal the disconnect in at least when it comes to federal spending, military versus mm -hmm. everything right. else. Right. If we're going to have jury systems, if we're going to have representative government, we need to be informed at the ground level. We need those juries to be informed. So if anything, yeah. we're out of time now, but it would highlight the deficit and abnormality right now in the American system where the disproportionality um, of what we spend on military versus every other human service, right. Right. Uh, but especially education. Yeah. And maybe in turn we would have very educated juries if in fact at tax season we would see that. And maybe not tax season, but we see how our money's getting spent in real time, which we don't. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for your time Thank today. Thank you so much. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at OpenMindTV for updates on future programming.